as most of you know, I am a very optimistic person, even when there doesn't seem to be much optimism to find. I always try to find the bright side. For me, the cup is always half full, not half empty. But this week was one of those weeks when being an optimist wasn't easy. But I do believe that the Bible has something to say about weeks when it seems easy to switch over to the side of the pessimist. When our world grows dark, the question is, how do we keep strong in our faith? There was an American man imprisoned by terrorists in the Middle East back in 2011, and he was held for 44 days. His faith sustained him through the ordeal, and he prayed unceasingly. He prayed for his family, and he wanted them to know that he was safe, but he had no way to tell them that. Maybe not safe the way you and I think of it, Prison in a foreign country is never safe, especially in the Middle East. But he wanted his family to understand that his soul was safe. One day in prison, he heard a knocking on the wall of his cell. He put his ear near the uh, wall socket, and he heard the muffled voice of an American contractor. And the contractor began to read to him from the book of Matthew, and they prayed together. He said, in a very calm voice, he'd, meet, or he'd read me the scripture once or twice a day, then I'd pray to stay strong. I'd pray to soften the hearts of our captors. I'd pray to God to lift the burdens we couldn't handle. And I'd pray that our moms would know that we were okay. When he was finally released, he immediately called home and he asked his mom, haven't you felt my prayers? She said that she had, and so had his family and friends. His parents held prayer vigils and spent hours on, the knee, on their knees while he was in prison. And his mom asked, have you felt our prayers? He said he had. Then he said, maybe it was those prayers strengthening me, keeping me afloat in the midst of my worst trials. That man's name, James Foley. He was the American journalist beheaded by Islamic extremists last week. I have not seen the entire video of what happened, nor do I ever want to. But it doesn't mean that I haven't escaped the brutality of what happened. There were several nights early this week when I literally was jarred awake, as in my head, my mind created what took place. I never saw the video, but my head tells me that I did. I have no idea if James Foley's faith played a role in the ISIS decision to execute him this last week. He was very careful to keep his faith quiet when he traveled in the Middle East for exactly that reason. But it wouldn't have been hard for the terrorists to recognize the faith of his parents in their writing and responses to them as they emailed back and forth. It wouldn't have been hard to find the writings of James Foley about his imprisonment in 2011 and discover that he had a strong faith. He prayed fervently in 2011. There is no doubt in my mind that prayer was a part of his captivity during the last two years. His death and the hands that took his life have genuinely affected me more than I expected. James Foley obviously had a deep and abiding faith. There are many other believers around the world right now who are facing a kind of darkness that we will never understand. So how can we have faith in the dark night of life? I want to present two accounts of persecution. Each one is a, a separate and distinct account, but they're tied together by circumstance and by faith. The first account begins in a land governed by tyrants. Throughout the land, people who believed in God were being ridiculed because they lived for Jesus Christ. Those who ruled believed the Christian faith, and those who believed in it were agitators. Believers were dangerous, but it was more than ridicule they faced. Soon they were being attacked. They were savagely persecuted. They were forced to run for their lives. They had to leave everything behind. It didn't matter how rich or how poor they were. If they were marked as a believer, they were marked for death. They had to leave everything in their haste to escape their homes, their businesses, their jobs, their church, their money, and their friends. They gathered up what belongings they could carry, and they fled as refugees. They tried to find a place to hide out and find safety. To practice their faith, they had to meet in secret. They could no longer meet publicly or worship in a church for fear of being found out. They met now as an underground church. That's the first account. But it's tied very closely with this next account another true account. They lived on the plains of Nineveh, but their home was no more. They had been persecuted for decades, but something had changed. To be a believer was a dangerous choice. 
Before they escaped, they saw believers killed just because they believed in Jesus Christ. They hoped they would be rescued. They cowered in their homes for as long as they could, but knew they had to leave. They gathered some clothes and left in the dark of night. They traveled as far as they could, and everywhere they went, they saw believers. In every garden, along dusty paths, hidden in the brush, many were wandering in a daze. There were so many who now had nothing and nowhere to go. They left Nineveh and found themselves with thousands of other believers, a people without a home. And now they were packed together as refugees. Worship was next to impossible. They knew the safest thing they could do was to meet in secret in what they called an underground church. Two accounts, two true stories, but they're more than 2,000 years apart. One account is from last month and actually in the last few days. The other is from the time of the Roman Empire. So which do you think is which? Was the first story from the Roman Empire or was the second story from the Roman Empire? The account of what happened in Nineveh is actually what happened in this last month. There are many historic biblical sites in what we now call Iraq. The Garden of Eden was in Iraq. Noah built the Ark in Iraq. The Tower of Babel was in Iraq. Abraham was from Ur, which is in southern Iraq. Babylon, which is in Iraq, destroyed Jerusalem. Daniel was in the lion's den in Iraq. Ezekiel preached in Iraq. The wise men from the Nativity story were from Iraq. And the Apostle Peter preached in what we now call Iraq. And that brings us to over 2,000 years ago. The first account was in the world of the Apostle Peter who preached in Iraq. He's the one that's famous for the account of Jesus walking on the water. Jesus asked Peter to step out of the boat. At first, Peter stood on the water, but he soon began to sink when he took his eyes off of Jesus. You of little faith, Jesus said, why did you doubt? And then it was Peter who denied Christ three times, just as Christ had predicted. The image of Peter as a coward and as one of little faith didn't last very long. After Pentecost, Peter boldly proclaimed the gospel, unafraid of arrest and persecution. But this was a time of danger. The Roman Empire was worried about this new religion that had begun to spring up everywhere. Certain emperors began to crack down and soon Christians were fleeing for their lives. And that's not much different than the account from Nineveh just last month. ISIS, the Islamic State in Syria, also called ISIL, has become a part of our vocabulary due to their barbarism against anyone who doesn't believe the way they do. But it appears they take special joy in killing Christians. In the land of the Bible, they're crucifying Christians. In the land of the Bible where our history is rooted, believers are being uprooted and being murdered. There is no other way to describe it but genocide. The two accounts walk hand in hand when it comes to the fear, the insecurity, and the uncertainty of daily living. These believers we learn about in the New Testament and these people of Iraq are bound together because they were both hunted down for slaughter. Amazingly enough, those in Iraq today are doing the same as Peter. They refuse to back down from their faith when the easiest thing to do is to say, no, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe that. Fox News reported on a family that refused to convert to Islam, even under the threat of death. A believer was quoted as saying, People say it would be easy to become a Muslim, but my faith is everything that I have. Why would I give that up? I would die first. Despite what it may sound like, there's actual hope in that statement. There's hope in a living God. They believe so strongly in God, they are not going to give up what they believe. My faith is everything I have. Why would I give that up? This is the hope that Peter speaks to as he addresses those who are in the same position as the believers in Iraq today. It gives a description of what's happening. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's writing to these people that have been spread far and wide. They've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Of course, receiving that letter, they're probably thinking, well, we're not feeling much peace right now. I read this and I thought, well, there's a reason that I've been reading First and Second Peter this week. The timing of what's happening in our world and reading through the New Testament have again brought my attention to the fact that with God, nothing is by accident. 
Peter wrote this letter and it was carried to those in the different locations mentioned. Scholars believe that listing of those different towns was actually the order that the uh, messenger was taking from town to town as he brought this letter to these people who had been scattered everywhere because they believed in Jesus Christ. In every case, these people suffered from anxiety, stress, and a constant worry that the slightest sound might be somebody coming to kill them. The people of God needed encouragement. They needed to know how to cope in the midst of immense suffering. They needed to know how to have faith in the dark. And today is no different. I can imagine some of them wondering how they could be secure when everything seemed so insecure. And Peter has an answer. You can keep faith in the dark when you have a living hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. New birth into a living hope, it says. New birth into a living hope. I love this passage because it describes God as, as not being off somewhere in outer space somewhere, but right here living with us. God cares about us. He cares about our welfare. He cares about what happens. When we ask Jesus into our hearts as our personal Lord and Savior, everything changes. From that point forward, we have a living hope that comes from the knowledge that we have, that we know that no matter what, we have eternal life in God. The knowledge of eternal life brings us comfort in the midst of trials. It's our living hope. It is our trust. It is our promise. Sometimes I think there's a misunderstanding about our lives when we first accept Christ in our hearts. I remember when I first came to God and came to understand what it meant to have Jesus in my heart and what salvation meant to me. And I started counting all the prizes that I got because I accepted Christ in my heart. I had a whole list. Let's see, I get, I get all my sins canceled out. Well, that's cool. I get all the things I did wrong are gone because I've turned them over to God. I receive forgiveness. What an awesome gift. A gift of forgiveness. Something that we have trouble handing out ourselves. God is freely giving to me. So, got another prize there. I have a Savior who is there for me no matter what happens. I have comfort in the midst of trials. Another free gift. But the one gift that I thought I was going to get, I didn't get. I thought that actually I was going to get a life with no trials, no pain, no suffering. Guess what? There's no prize like that. Peter makes that very, very clear. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now this is not the first time in the New Testament we heard, hear words like this. Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He didn't say, I have overcome the world, and just period, that's it. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. In the world you will have trials. In the world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. How can you be of good cheer? But that's exactly what he's saying. We can have good cheer in the living hope of Christ. In Hebrews, we learn that God tests us by trials and troubles. James mentions the testings that come from God. Paul seems to have the idea of suffering put on repeat throughout his writings. And here comes Peter saying the same thing. You will have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So Peter makes it very clear that we will face trials in life. But he doesn't leave it at that. He doesn't just say it. He explains why we're going to face trials. And the first is that it proves that our faith is genuine. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The example he gives here is gold refined by fire. After gold is mined, it's placed in a furnace where it's melted, and the impurities separate, and they take those impurities away, leaving pure gold. Peter is saying that we will be tested by fire, we will be tested by trials, we will be tested by trouble. How do I know what I believe is really what I believe when I'm faced with a trial? Because if you're somebody who runs away every time something goes wrong and you blame God, then I question, do you really believe in God? When something goes wrong, do I say it's God's fault for what's happened? Do I turn away from my faith? I've been through some pretty dark times in my life, times when I when people have questioned why I don't turn away from the faith, when people have let me down and other friends have said, see, 
what you're going through. There's no reason to believe what you believe, and yet that is what I would cling to in the midst of my trials. Let's ask again what somebody who's facing death in Iraq says about it. People say it would be easy to become a Muslim, but my faith is everything I now have. Why would I give that up? I would die first. Is that faith genuine? Do you believe it? I believe it. So our living hope is tested to see if our faith is genuine. But there's another reason. We also go through trials to be drawn closer to God. The people Peter is writing to will never meet Jesus personally. They never met him. And yet they know Jesus personally. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's amazing how quickly we cry out to God when we go through a time of trial. We draw closer to God as we realize God is our living hope. We will search it out and find it in the strangest of places. James Foley clung to the words of the book of Matthew spoken through a wall socket in prison. It's amazing how close we draw to God in the darkest of places. Faith in the dark isn't easy. But I do remain optimistic, and the reason I can smile, even in the midst of what's gone on this past week and what we've seen going on in Iraq, is because I know that I have a living hope in Christ. And no matter what happens, I know that I have eternal life. I don't embrace death. I don't want death to come, even though I know there's a glorious future. I love life. I love the opportunity to reach out to others and tell others about the faith that I have. Faith in the dark isn't easy, though, and don't get me wrong, I'm still an optimist. And the reason I am an optimist is the, an old hymn that we used to sing growing up in a Southern Baptist church. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. God has made a promise to me that no matter what happens, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, he is there with me. At some point, we all are going to have to make a decision. Do we really believe what we say we believe? Do we really believe in God? And if we do, we can have faith in the dark. In the darkest of times, we can know that God is there for us.